today we will start an important section of condensed matter physics namely magnetism. We have just finished discussing the mechanism of dielectric polarization in dielectric materials, how an applied electric field polarizes a dielectric medium and produces a polarization with various effects such as dispersion, phase transition into the ferroelectric phase and things like that. We will now go on to a very similar process which takes place in magnetic materials. In the case of magnetism instead of a dielectric or electric polarization we will have a magnetization which is caused by an applied magnetic field. So, the analogy is very clear just as the dielectric polarization is established by an applied electric field, a magnetization is produced in a magnetic material by an applied magnetic field. The process by which this magnetization is established goes on lines which is very similar to that of electric polarization. Of course, there are very significant and important fundamental differences also. So, in the course of this lecture and in a few subsequent lectures, we will be discussing some of these processes and mechanisms. To start with, magnetism is a well known phenomenon of nature, which has attracted the attention of people from time immemorial. immemorial. We know that people have talked about lodestones. In, uh, Sanskrit people have talked poetry, they have talked about Ayaskante in a Lohavatu. So, they have talked about how a magnet attracts iron. Similarly, people talked about lodestone. Mariners, people who go on voyages in the sea, have used the magnetic compass to know the direction in the sea. So, these are all uh, known for a very, very long time since ancient times. So, magnetism is a phenomenon which is very well known. Even Aryabhata has talked about the magnetism. So, the phenomenon of magnetism occupies a central position in condensed matter physics. There are reasons for this, not because magnetism in particular is a special topic, it is similar to many other important topics, but the entities which produce magnetization, which magnetize a material, namely they are known as spins, magnetic spins, spin angular momentum. It is something which is new to classical physics. It is a totally new degree of freedom in the case of electronic, atomic and molecular systems, but the spins are probably the cleanest physical entities to teach, uh, treat theoretically as well as experimentally. The spins give rise to magnetic effects and can be studied by a variety of techniques and can be described theoretically to a very considerable extent with great success. Now, all magnetism mainly arises from the electrons of the atoms and molecules. Of course, the nuclei also produce magnetic effects. We will discuss this later, but for reasons which will become clear later on, magnetism as a phenomenon is mainly due to the electrons in atoms and molecules. There is no classical way of describing magnetism. In fact, there is a theorem by There is a theorem due to Bohr and von Leeuwen which states that if you apply classical statistical mechanical considerations to an assembly of electrons which produce magnetism, you will find that the average magnetization vanishes. So, you cannot account for any magnetism 
using classical theories. Magnetism is essentially a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So, this is the first point to be understood that in order to understand magnetism, we have to learn quantum mechanics or at least be familiar with the fundamental principles of quantum, quantum physics, because we are talking about the orbital motion of electrons as well as spin of electrons. Spin is a completely quantum mechanical effect, relativistic quantum mechanical effect. Even the orbital motion in a finite sample, the macroscopic magnetic moment produced by the orbital angular momenta of electrons vanishes identically by Bohr and van Leeuwen's theorem. Therefore, in order to know how this magnetism arises and in order to quantitatively describe the behavior of this magnetic moment, one has to apply quantum mechanics and quantum statistical physical concepts. So, this is the first point to be realized. Next, we will ask how there is the magnetic moment is produced for an electron. In the case of an electron, we all know that the electron is orbiting around the nucleus of an atom. And similarly, in the case of a molecule, there are molecular orbitals in which the electron is supposed to be moving. So, because of this motion, this orbital motion, whenever the charge is moving, a current is produced in that loop. So, this orbit is like a current carrying loop and a current carrying loop always produces a magnetic moment as all state described first discovered. So, we know that the orbital motion it is very easy to see that the orbital motion of an electron will produce magnetic field, because the orbit of an electron around the nucleus serves as a closed current loop in which the current does not vanish. So, this is theoretically described by saying that the orbiting electron has an orbital angular momentum. Which is usually denoted by the letter L in books on quantum mechanics or J, this is orbital, but usually there is also a spin angular momentum which we will discuss later and that is represented by the letter S and so there is a total angular momentum is described as by the letter represented by the letter J. So, all these angular momenta are quantized according to the rules of quantum mechanics. In other words, the orbital angular momentum can only be in units in integral multiples of a fundamental unit, which is you usually the fundamental unit of angular momentum is h by 2 pi or h cross, where h is the Planck's constant. So, the angular momentum is measured as j h cross. When we say that the angular momentum is j, what we mean is the angular momentum is j h by 2 pi. If this is so, then quantum mechanics also tells us that there is a corresponding magnetic moment due to this angular momentum which is represented usually by the letter mu and that is proportional to this angular momentum, orbital angular momentum. 
So, mu equal to gamma j, where gamma is known as the magneto gyric ratio. In other words, it is the ratio of the magnetic moment to the gyro or angular momentum. In older books, this would have been written as gyro magnetic ratio. Gamma is the magneto gyric ratio. So, this only means that the more magnetic moment vector both mu and j are vector quantities. So, the magnetic moment is parallel to the orbital angular momentum or the total angular momentum. So, this is what this expression says. We would like to understand how this magnetic moment arises. As I said, this has been to be done in the framework of quantum mechanics. So, let us do some basic quantum mechanics by writing the Schrodinger equation of an electron in an atom. placed in a magnetic field in a uniform magnetic field, uniform static magnetic field whose direction is taken as the z direction. So, how do we write the equation, the Schrodinger equation for such an electron. We know that this electron is in the potential of the nucleus. So, we have the standard way in the absence of an applied magnetic field, the electron Hamiltonian, this is the Hamiltonian which is the starting point of writing the Schrodinger equation is just equal to p square by 2 m plus v of r, where p is the linear momentum. And in quantum mechanics, p is an operator which is represented by minus i h cross del. m is the mass of the electron, v of r is the coulomb potential of the nucleus. It is written as V of R because we know that the nucleus exerts a center, central coulomb potential and therefore, it is a function only of the distance between the electron and the nucleus. So, this gives me the Hamiltonian as minus i h cross del square by 2 m plus v and the Schrodinger equation is just h psi equal e psi, where psi is the wave function. And e is the energy eigenvalue. This Hamiltonian gets modified when a magnetic field is applied. Again, quantum theory tells us that, in fact, this is an electrodynamic result that when there is an applied magnetic field, this magnetic field has an induction which is given by a vector potential A. So, this is the magnetic induction field. and A is the vector potential and B and A are related in this form. 
So, if B is constant and uniform directed along the z direction, we can write it in this form. And if this is so, we can choose the, the form of the vector potential, which will give you a B like this can be chosen as half r cross b. This is a standard result from electrodynamics, which can be written in the form So, these are the components of the vector potential in Cartesian coordinates. Now, when such a magnetic field is applied, the Hamiltonian gets modified in the following manner. The P, the operator P is replaced by the operator P minus A. So, that is the result of classical physics. So, P goes to P minus A. And therefore, the Hamiltonian in a magnetic field is written as minus i h cross del minus E a by whole square by 2 m plus V f r. So, this is the Hamiltonian and therefore, h psi equals and this is is this is given e equal to E psi that is the Schrodinger equation, where we can now replace A by these components and rewrite this. When we do this, we get H cross square by 2 m del square that is the first term from squaring this and then we have another term plus E square A square by 2 m and then we have cross terms minus i h cross by 2 m into a dot del plus del dot a. We cannot just write 2 del dot a, we have to keep the sequences separate. So, we have two such terms, one from this del dot a, another from a dot del. Then we have v f r. or v f x y z in one time x y z psi equals e psi, where we can now substitute for a square and a. So, that is the Schrodinger equation which has to be solved in order to find the eigenvalues of energy and that is how we can find the magnetic moment. So, if we do this, we arrive at this result. we have minus h cross square del square by 2 m, which is the kinetic energy term that is the kinetic energy term of the electron. Then we have minus i h cross by 2 m and then we have a dot del plus del dot a. In order to go further, we choose the gauge, we have the freedom to choose the gauge in which we work and we choose the coulomb gauge. In which del dot a equals 0, if we apply this condition, we can show that a dot del and del dot a become the same, so that this becomes Then we have, well, this becomes plus and then this because of the minus sign, where we can now replace a square. A square is nothing but we have there b naught square by 4 into x square plus y square is a square. And similarly, for A, we have those results there. So, A dot del 
will simply become minus b naught by 2 into minus y d by d x plus x d by d y. And remembering that minus i h cross del is the momentum operator, this can be written as where p x p y are the components of p x and y components. So, this is nothing but the z component of the orbital angular momentum L z. If L is r cross p, which is the definition of orbital angular momentum, L z will be just x p y minus y p x. Therefore, the Schrodinger equation can now be rewritten in a very simple form. I have forgotten E here. So, E h cross by m into L z psi plus one fourth E square B naught square by m 2 m into x square plus y square psi plus V psi equals E psi. Now, we cannot need not even solve this Schrodinger equation to understand what this means. We can just look at it by inspection we can interpret the various terms in this energy. Hamiltonian is nothing but the energy. So, what is the Hamiltonian operator? This term is the kinetic energy. and this is the potential energy and the Schrodinger equation simply says this plus this plus these terms is equal to the total energy. Obviously, these are the two terms which arise which contribute to the energy on account of the application of the static magnetic field steady magnetic field. Okay. So, this means we have forgotten B naught by 2. Right. So, this H cross is absorbed in L z, L z is really H cross times because L z is measured in units of H cross. So, this is these are the two terms, extra terms which represent the magnetic energy, the additional contribution to the energy from the application of the magnetic field. One of them is negative, another is positive. That is very revealing. What do you mean by a negative energy and a positive energy? For this, we have to just go back to classical electrodynamics and see what happens when a dipole of magnetic moment mu is placed in an applied magnetic field B. Then the energy is just minus mu dot B. Therefore, we know that the magnetic moment is just nothing but d E minus d E by d B. Where, so by looking at the Hamiltonian operator, if we write it in operator form, this is just mu operator is minus dH by dB. So if you look at these two terms in the Hamiltonian, let us look at what we get. The negative term gives me mu one is LZ B naught. 
that is the contribution. Now, similarly, the other term is going to give me this is going to give me minus e square. Well, there is a 1 by 2 m and e by 2 m and here it is e square by 4 into well it should be 2 m square right. Okay, I will we'll see about that e square by 2 m into 1 by 4 b naught square into x square plus y square. So, this is a negative term a negative magnetic moment whereas, this is a positive magnetic moment and what is the interpretation of this? Whenever we have a magnetic field magnetizing a material, if you get a magnetic moment which is parallel or in the same direction as the applied magnetic field, we say that the material is paramagnetic. A paramagnetic material is one in which the magnetic moment is parallel to magnetic field. Whereas, if the magnetic moment is anti parallel, then we call it a diamagnetic material. So, we have two cases here one giving a magnetic moment which is parallel to the applied magnetic field which is also directed along the z direction and the other gives a term which contributes to a magnetic moment which is anti parallel to the magnetic field because this is a positive definite everything is a square and therefore, you have a negative sign. So, it gives a negative magnetic moment which indicates that the magnetic moment is anti parallel to the applied magnetic field. So, this is a paramagnetic term this is a diamagnetic term. So, by simply looking at the Hamiltonian of the electron in an applied magnetic field and looking at the various terms in the presence of the field, we are in a position to say that there are two new contributions to the energy arising from the application of the magnetic field. One of these contributions is a paramagnetic contribution and the other one is a diamagnetic contribution. The paramagnetic contribution comes from the alignment of the angular momentum vector in the direction of the applied magnetic field. So, just like in the case of the dielectric polarization, we saw that there was an electric dipole which gets lined up in the direction of the applied electric field creating a dielectric polarization. In the same way, here we have an electronic magnetic moment which is like a dipolar magnetic moment. There is no monopole in nature this lowest order magnetic moment is that of a dipole. Therefore, the electronic dipole lines itself in the direction of the applied magnetic field and gives rise to a paramagnetic contribution which has this form and this is the gyro magnetogyric ratio E by 2 m is the magnetogyric ratio. So, this is equal to gamma and in addition the orbital motion of the electron because the electron is orbiting round this has a classical explanation. So, if you have an orbiting current loop a closed current loop in which charge is circulating this current loop when an applied magnetic field is produced uh, by Lenz's law there is a back EMF induced and therefore, there is a resistance to this motion and 
this change this changes the acceleration the centripetal acceleration of the electron in its orbital motion and therefore, this produces a change in the angular momentum and therefore, induces a magnetic moment which is of diamagnetic origin. Now, this is of course, for an individual electron if you have a macroscopic sample in which there are a large number of 10 to power 23 or so of atoms or molecules each of which contains several electrons then we make a quantum mechanical and statistical average. Now, for this the average is x square plus y square average. So, the average magnetic moment quantum mechanical average is just this this these brackets represent average. So, the quantum mechanical average can be easily figured out because we know that in Cartesian coordinates r square is x square plus y square plus z square, where x y z are the components of r for any general position direction with position vector r. Therefore, if you take the average since all three directions x y z are equally probable the quantum mechanical average of this s square plus y square plus z square is. So, substituting this we can calculate the diamagnetic moment using this result. So, now we go to the magnetic moment terms and look at them closely. So, we have the paramagnetic moment this is the paramagnetic energy the energy due to this because this is the Hamiltonian operator. So, the magnetic moment is just got by differentiating and this will remove this because we have differentiated uh, the linear term in the Hamiltonian. So, the B goes off. So, we simply have paramagnetic moment is E by 2 m into L z. So, that is mu z since it is directed along the z direction. So, this is the z component of the paramagnetic moment and that is why comparing it with our earlier equation mu equal to gamma j we arrive at the result that gamma the magnetogyric ratio is just E by 2 m. And in the case of the diamagnetic term the result the corresponding result is E square by 2 m into B square will give you another 2 2 B. So, just B times uh, R square into 2 by 3 into 1 by 4 which is 1 by 6. So, this will give me minus e square b b b by 6 m times r square where r square is the quantum mechanical average of the square of the orbital radius of the electron. See, this is if the electron cloud is spherically symmetric. So, this is the basic theory due to Langevin. Langevin's theory and this gives you the diamagnetic moment. This is the contribution to the diamagnetic moment due to one orbiting electron. If there are z orbiting electron this has to be multiplied by z and if there are n atoms or molecules then it has to be further multiplied by n. So, that will give you the total diamagnetic moment in an assembly of n atoms each containing z electrons. So, this is the basic theory due to Langevin which uh, explains the diamagnetic moment which has a negative sign. 
the all matter which contain atoms or molecules and therefore orbiting electrons around nuclei or molecular centers because of that every material is basically diamagnetic. There is a diamagnetism associated with every atom or molecule in nature. Therefore, there is no material which is not diamagnetic. This diamagnetism is present only when there is a field. If the field is removed, it vanishes. So, this is an induced effect, diamagnetism is induced and is a reaction to the applied magnetic field which stays only as long as the applied magnetic field exists. So, the diamagnetic moment vanishes when the field is removed. Whereas, the paramagnetic term is a permanent magnetic moment, which is determined by the component of the orbital angular momentum along the direction of the applied field. So, this situation is very similar to the polarizability of an atom in the presence of an applied electric field. In the case of dielectric polarization, this polarizability is 0 once the field is applied electric field becomes is removed. Similarly, the polarizability as well as the diamagnetic moment are induced effects, whereas there are permanent dipoles, electric dipoles like water, water in the case of dielectric polarization. These dipoles get aligned along the electric field giving rise to a polar dipolarization, polarization associated with the polar nature of such a dielectric. In the same way, we have materials which can become paramagnetic because there is, there are, uh, there is an uh, angular momentum and associated with this angular momentum there is a dipole magnetic magnet and this dipole lines up in the direction of the magnetic field and therefore, this is parallel to the applied magnetic field. The energy prop of contribution is negative because the energy is minus mu dot b. The paramagnetic moment is present all the time for a material and this will be there only if the orbital angular momentum is not 0. So, these are the main differences. Now, this E by 2 m, E by 2 m and as I already told you L z is an integer times h cross. So, E h cross by 2 m, this has a value 9.27 into 10 to the power minus 24 joules per tesla. So, this has a special name, this is the fundamental unit of magnetic moment in quantum mechanics in all electronic materials. Therefore, this has a special name, it is called the Bohr magneton. So, we measure magnetic moments of electrons in units of the Bohr magneton. Now, this immediately tells us why the nuclear contribution is not very important in the case of magnetism because of the presence of the mass term here. So, the nuclear mass is 2000 times more than that of the electron. So, the nuclear magnetic moment is going to be weaker by that factor. So, it is three orders weaker. Therefore, the nuclear magnetism is not seen easily. The thing that is seen generally is the electronic magnetic moment. We will stop at this point, continue next time.